that's our next. Uh... Bye, bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, and see you. Um, next uh, session, uh, which is going to be a roundtable uh, on folk tales and children's literature uh, from our wonderful uh, experts. Uh, in the topic who I have the distinct pleasure of introducing very quickly uh, and then uh, leave the floor to them. So uh, Dr. Emily Murphy is a senior lecturer uh, in children's literature at Newcastle University uh, in the United Kingdom. She is the author of uh, Growing Up with America, Youth, Myth and National Identity, 1945 to Present, which was the winner of the 2021 International uh, Research Society for Children's Literature Book Award. Her current research includes a, a new monograph, um, The Anarchy of Children's uh, Archives, Children's Literature and Global Citizenship uh, Education in the American cen uh, Century, as well as two -year, uh, a two-year re research project, Beyond the School Day, Children's Contribution to Community Integration, which was founded uh, by the British Ac Academy and Nuffield Foundation um, as part of the, the uh, joining us as well uh, is Orin James, uh, who has a wide background, uh, and uh, uh, Brett Pitt Bradford from Binghamton uh, State University of New York, where he taught vertebrate zoology and human anatomy and physiology, as well as hybrid courses to inc that included discussions of social philosophy, determinism, colonialism, race, sex, etc. He writes poetry, takes photographs, and uh, is the host of his own web-based radio show. His research interest also includes art, in particular puppetry, as a means of addressing mental health. And uh, Gabriella Lee, uh, who is a doctorate student in the English department at the University of Pittsburgh, while she is on leave from her faculty position at the Department of English and, Contemporary, uh, and Comparative Literature at UP Diliman. Her research uh, interest includes um, include science fiction and fantasy studies, children's and young adult literature, digital and transmedia narratives, and contemporary Philippine literature in English. She has published several books of fiction, including instructions on how to disappear stories, uh, disturbing the universe poems, and Laon uh, and the Seven-Headed Dragon. She received the grand prize at the 2019 uh, PBBY Selang uh, Awards, which was released uh, as a uh, series crocodile, the story uh, and arc of Ar 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 Araceli Lamas uh, Lamasako uh, Dom. I'm hoping that I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly. She's working on her uh, second collection of uh, short stories, her first young adult novel, and editing a book on Philippines uh, speculative fiction. And last but not least, um, I also have the distinct pleasure of introducing Christine Case, uh, who is a, a PhD candidate at the University of Pittsburgh, where she teaches undergraduate classes in children's literature and childhood studies, as well as gender, sexuality, and women's studies. Her research uh, centers uh, upon the ways in which fairy tale storytelling reflect uh, and construct cultural norms and power structures from uh, Broadway to fantasy theme parks. Uh, her, uh, she charts how unique uh, modes of embodiment, racial uh, disabled uh, technology, uh, both in, uh, in strange and invite in their audiences, remaining uh, uh, reimagining what fairy tale texts can signify and who they include. Um, and without further ado, I would very much like to uh, just uh, carry on and turn the table over to uh, the four of them for this round table, which sounds very fascinating. I'm so, sorry. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, great. So I'm just gonna say a few minutes, a few things about the round table very quickly, because I know we're pressed for time and we're a little bit over to get back on schedule. And um, so what we wanna do today is to really make this a conversation with you all. So we've planned five minutes each um, a response to a question, um, what does storytelling mean to you and how do you incorporate it into your teaching? And so we're gonna start off with that and then and start to invite you all to contribute your own experiences, to ask questions about what we said so far. And hopefully that will just organically develop from there. I've got some other questions in my pocket just in case uh, to get things going. Um, but just wanted to give you a little sense of the format. And so with that, I'm gonna hand over to Christine who's first up is going to say a little bit about how she would respond to that question about what storytelling means to her and how she uses it in her teaching. 
Absolutely. So my name is Christine. My pronouns are she and her. And my research is the one that focuses on how forms of story, fairy tale storytelling reflect and construct cultural norms and power structures. Um, my research is currently focused in the global north, and that's due to mostly to the funding opportunities I've been able to receive thus far. So we are here today to explore how global educators may teach through storytelling. Not only do stories themselves teach certain morals and skills, but I also believe that all teaching is storytelling. As educators, we consider both the content of our lessons as well as the method of teaching those lessons. We craft narratives about what is important to learn, how these topics relate to one another, and what the relationships between students and educators can look like. In terms of content, I encourage my undergraduate students to interrogate the act of storytelling as an act of power. Here, storytelling encompasses the books we read and media we consume, yes, but also touches upon citizenship requirements, gender norms, poly policy decisions, what have you. My classes practice identifying the narrative networks around them and asking questions such as, who is telling the story? From what subject position? Who is the presumed audience? What is taken for granted? For example, we read the 2018 book Circe by Madeline Miller, which tells events from the Odyssey from Circe's perspective. Here, she turns Odysseus's crew to pigs for a reason, a retaliation for gang rape. Circe explores the complexity of myths and legends, reputations, penance, and power. Or we read 2020's Prairie Lotus by Linda Sue Park, whose protagonist Hannah, a 14-year-old Asian-American girl, confronts the racialized realities of pioneer towns so glorified and perpetuated by so-called classic stories like The Little House on the Prairie. In terms of method, I am motivated by queer and trauma-informed pedagogies, as well as a general sense of transparency and humanity in my relationships with my students. Moving beyond those queer pedagogies, which tie queerness to the content of texts or the bodies of LGBTQAI plus students and teachers alone, compositionist Stacey Waite understands writing and teaching as themselves already queer practices which may disrupt how we understand ourselves to ourselves. So how can writing and teaching delight in impossibility, excess, and failure? This approach tells a story about stories, about content and classroom experience, which encourages student experimentation. And I make sure to couple this approach with grading metrics that allow for revision. For one assignment, I prompted students to imagine fiction or creative writing as also a research-based composition, asking what research have authors conducted in order to craft this text, such as the great poetic treatise Zong by M. Norbesi Phillips. Students have turned in some of the most innovative, heart-wrenching writing I have ever seen when guided through these environments, writing which has also assisted them in processing trauma. I am currently on a research trip. I am visiting fantasy themed amusement parks across four countries in Western Europe, Denmark, Sweden, the Netherlands, and France, asking how do nations tell stories about themselves through fairy tales and fairy tale traditions. I add this to my domestic research at Disney World in Florida and Disneyland in California, where I have been investigating disability access policies, asking who is easily integrated into fairy tale landscapes and for whom is that performance of belonging less straightforward or attainable? What stories do corporations and fellow guests tell about who belongs in the space and with what accommodations? These narratives regarding included versus excluded, incorporated versus ejected bodies both reflect and perpetuate ableist as well as heterosexist and racist norms. So as you can see, I think about storytelling a lot. We live in matrices of storytelling and these stories and scripts we uphold versus those we challenge teach those around us who we are and what we value. And with that, I will turn it over to Gabby. So, um, hi, my name is Gabriella Lee. Um, I wear many hats for the many roles I have in my life. Um, so I'm from the Philippines. I am a writer of fiction and children's stories. I am a faculty member at the English department at the University of the Philippines, and I'm also an incoming second year PhD student here at the University of Pittsburgh's English department. 
Um, I'm also a wife. I am a daughter. I am a friend. I am a teacher. I am a student, so on and so forth. And in all of these roles, I have seen storytelling as a valuable tool to navigate the currents of both my work as a student and a teacher and in my daily life. So when I talk about stories, I'm not just talking about um, literary texts or multimedia products. I'm also referring to storytelling techniques that we use in organizing our lives, the stories we tell ourselves that form part of our identity and our sense of self. So we form stories about ourselves, like who we are, where we come from, and where we want to go in the future. Um, one of my favorite TV shows, Doctor Who, uh, reminds us that we're all stories in the end, and we are, rem we are remembered through the stories that other people tell about us. So in both my pedagogy and creative slash critical practice, I think of storytelling and learning as working hand in hand. To me, storytelling functions in three distinct ways. It is commemorative, it is representative, and it is recuperative. So when I say storytelling is commemorative, um, I mean that it acts as both a mnemonic device for learning as well as a way to remember and commemorate personal and collective histories. So telling stories to each other requires the storyteller to remember what happened and for the listener to be sensitive and empathetic to the details being relayed. Um, for instance, when I teach creative writing, one of my uh, common writing exercises include asking student writers to write a short narrative about a childhood memory. So after writing their drafts, I ask them to read each other's works and mark the sections that seem especially evocative or memorable and share this with the class. So in this manner, they learn both storytelling techniques that draw a response from the reader, while at the same time learning how to find new ways to effectively convey their own stories. Um, second, when I say that storytelling is representative, I also mean that reading and writing stories that consciously showcase a diversity of characters and experiences are valuable in acknowledging that the human experience is also diverse and multifaceted. So Rudine Sims Bishop, a stalwart in the field of children's literature studies, uses the phrase mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors to describe how different stories are able to provide access to different worlds. So she says that some stories act as windows, allowing readers a peek into a different world and giving them a chance to exercise empathy and curiosity. But windows can also become mirrors, reflecting the reader's value to the world and confirming that their presence is important and worthy. And when stories become sliding glass doors, then the story acts as a portal where readers can easily slip from our world into the world of the imagination. In this way, being conscious of the texts I use in both my classroom and in my research is valuable. I try to privilege underrepresented authors and stories, center female authors and creators in both my reading lists and in my research. Um, finally, I think that storytelling is also recuperative. In a world that's fractured with so many global issues and problems, it is very easy to lose hope. Storytelling both inside and outside the classroom gives us a chance to reimagine the world and to find hope in what can seem to be a hopeless place. For instance, in the film Everything Everywhere All at Once, nihilism is represented as an all-encompassing force that seeks to consume everything in its path. It is contrasted by radical empathy as represented by the character played by Ki Hui Kwan. These abstract concepts are concretized through storytelling, allowing the audience to understand and connect with these ideas in a concrete and visual manner, and hopefully be able to use them in their day-to-day -day lives. So thank you very much. And I will pass this on, I think, to Emily. Am I right? Yes, um, for the next section. Just had to unmute. Okay, great. Um, so hi again, everyone. My name is Emily Murphy, and I'm a senior lecturer in children's literature at Newcastle University. And so my research focuses on global education for children, looking specifically at 20th, cent 20th century American movements in a global context. However, I'm also really interested in interdisciplinary methods for telling the history of global education, and I'm always looking for new ways to listen to and recover the stories of historical children's voices. I use many of these ideas and methods in my teaching as well for my undergraduate students, as I think it's important for them to understand that the idea of being a global citizen is not new, and also how the values associated with this concept have changed and shifted over time. 
Because terms like global education and global citizenship are very abstract, I'd like to give you one brief example of how I incorporate storytelling in the classroom. And one of the units for my undergraduate course, Growing Up Global, we focus on environmental themes in children's literature, moving as we do between literary texts and historical materials as a way of putting these stories in context. In my lecture for this unit, I give the example of Jean Craighead George, best known for her award-winning books like Julie of the Wolves and My Side of the Mountain. A daughter to two naturalists, George lived and breathed the environmental science that she incorporated into her stories. And she claims to be the first American writer to invent what she calls the ecological mystery or stories that use the mystery genre and combine them with the scientific method to teach children about environmental issues such as the impact of DT DDT on local ecosystems. While George's life as an author is fascinating, her archive attests to this, uh, which I've recently been to with documentation of her trips into the Alaskan wilderness, including recordings of her howling with wolves. I'm serious about this, very long recordings. Uh, more interesting are the narratives that children wrote back in response to these stories. So what I want my students who are no longer children to remember is that young people's voices are just as important as the stories written for them. And that we must think about ways to listen to these voices if we truly want to enact change on global issues like climate change. George understood this too. She frequently visited classrooms and would sit down daily to write back to her fans. In one video interview, we even see her chuckling as she comments, well, now he really did read the book and in another commenting on the beauty of one young girl's poem about nature. With my time remaining, I'll share just one example of a letter written to George, in this case from a ninth grade girl from Japan in response to her Newbery book, Julie of the Wolves. The wolves in the story really made me see the likeness between man and animals. Even in the wolf pack, there was a leader, Amarok, his wife, companion, babysitter, and pups. Throughout the story, I could see my ex maturing along with the pups. First, she was helpless and then later came to be able to do things for herself. The death of Amarok was very tear jerking as well as when Tournay died and really made me understand that we have to save our wildlife. Was this one of your purposes to write this book? Julie of the Wolves also helped me realize the sad fact that life has become more modern and we aren't living in rhythm with nature anymore. With the materials such as this, I encourage my students to think about how young people are imagining themselves as global citizens. In this case, what is their role in saving and recovering the planet? George received letters from children from around the world, not just Americans, and her books inspired young people to reflect on the current issues plaguing their local ecosystems, whether they lived in a small Midwestern town in the United States or the bustling cosmopolitan city of Tokyo. While I don't have time to fully unpack what I've presented here right now, I hope this will help launch us into a lively discussion about the different ways that we incorporate storytelling into our teaching. And I very much look forward to hearing examples from your experiences as educators committed to teaching global issues as well. Thank you. And I'll hand over. All right. And thank you all. It's uh, very difficult to follow these talks. Um, especially when you're uh, a biologist. So uh, my name is Oren James. It's a pleasure to have you all in the room. Um, I, I'm a native of Brooklyn, New York. I studied bio, biochemistry for my undergraduate studies. And I, during my time as an undergrad, studying biochemistry introduced me to the scientists from all over the world that contributed to all of the natural sciences, not just physics, not just biology, but all of the natural sciences and many of them, uh, especially during the 20th century, seem to have come from Germany. So being an undergraduate student and being required to learn another language, I chose German as my second language. And I was also able to take a trip over to Germany to study the language and study the culture a little bit more. Then I came back to the United States to pursue uh, my graduate studies, and I, I focused on cryopreservation, so how insects survive sub-zero temperatures, and that's what my current day research focuses on. 
Uh, the reason I studied this is because when humans donate their organs, there's a high chance that these organs will be put in a freezer uh, for some time until a recipient is made available. But if a recipient is not made available within a certain time, pr time frame, th those organs can easily deteriorate. Think of freezer burn or your ice cream that's been left in the freezer for too long. That's what can happen. So what I look at is how these insects preserve their organs under frozen conditions. And I hope to apply that to human organs. And we've made some significant progress. In fact, we were able to extract proteins. Uh, they're called antifreeze proteins, and they can inhibit ice formation or ice growth, this way protecting the organs. So that's my research. It sounds very medical. It has lots of medical application. And this drew a lot of students in the medical or students pursuing medical careers into my, into my laboratory. And the challenge that I saw with the students was a challenge in which how do they take what they're learning and not only apply it to what's already, of, what's readily available, but also alter in some ways um, some, some things of a system that will make things easier for humans. And what I'm referring to is the healthcare system essentially. So many of my students are coming in wanting to become doctors, nurses, uh, physician assistants, healthcare workers. And what I hope to do is share with them not only the tools they need to be successful, but also ways in which they can alter the healthcare system if they find a problem. And one of my strategies to do this was exactly the same strategy that I had as an undergraduate student, to study abroad. So I developed a study abroad program where I take the students over to Austria to compare the healthcare differences between America, Austria, and Central, Euro Central European nations. Um, the, the advantage of studying abroad is not only to expose a student to another culture, but also expose the student to ways in which to learn about another culture. So what do I mean by this? Um, tourists normally will go to uh, country, they'll know the, the major tourist sites, they'll know where the, the things are, but what they might not get is the underlying justification for those sites and the history behind those sites. And that is a, a, uh, a means of learning the culture that is going back and understanding their history and understanding why uh, they're able to sustain the type of healthcare system they have. So it's very cultural. So they have to learn the culture in order, in order to understand that level of, of the society. And so the beauty of the uh, study abroad program was just that. But then the, the challenge is how do you then introduce them to that culture? And one of the means I use is storytelling or fairy tales. So we've heard the use of fairy tales from all of our previous presenters. And the way I use it is for the students to remind, to remember where these things are coming from and how they reach the point. So how is it that the Germans, the Austrians, uh, Europeans were able to invent what they invented? Um, so how do I do this and how do I uh, bring it into my lab? Well, here is a device you'll normally see in a lab, a microscope. <laughs> you'll also see a stethoscope in a lab, if, if you're dealing with health care, you'll also see uh, models like this, right, to talk about. But what you don't see are tools in which to tell the story. And what I do is I present those tools to the students to tell the story. The tools I use are coming from Central Europe. Uh, this is a marionette. Uh, I call him Faust. I made this with my hands, I carved it out, and I used the trees. <laughs> it's called linden tree, lipa or lime tree or basswood in America. And I've also introduced into the lab a theater. So this is my marionette theater. These are marionettes that I'm currently working on. And what I then introduced the students to are stories that are very pertinent to the development of science. So one in particular is this, the creation of the stethoscope. 
the stethoscope, as you can imagine, is really a microphone and a headphone. But the person who invented it was a musician and he used the flute. He understood the, the use of wind and he used the flute. Uh, he reconstructed the flute to listen to the lungs, auscultation from the back and then hear heart sounds later. So how do we then present that story to the public? I use the theater. And if you were listening to uh, Sean, uh, I might be getting the name wrong, Gil Laurie, the previous speaker, he mentioned the use of audio and the visual. So combined, that's exactly what we use here. Uh, in the theater, uh, you can use something called the Gesamtkunstwerk. It's a word coined by Wagner. And it's, it's in reference to the theater. The theater allows all of the senses to, to connect. Uh, visual, sound, touch. Um, you'll, you'll, you'll be touching the seats. You'll, be, you know, you'll grab the seats if you're um, experiencing some sort of emotion. And not only that, but the sound. And the sound that's used to elicit emotions tend to come from uh, different types of compositions. The Russians, for example, Mussorgsky, would use certain sounds that would bring to mind a witch is on the way in or death is around the corner or something like that. So sounds uh, get used very much uh, in the uh, puppet theater. And so what I encourage students to do is to learn the stories of, of these countries. Uh, so it's a very global experience, very interdisciplinary experience. And, and just learn how to present. Um, I, I teach a course on how to make these puppets and how the stories are told. Um, important historical events include 1848, uh, especially during in, in Central Europe when this was a time many of the uh, countries that were under the Austrian-Hungarian Empire were sort of striving for independence. They would use the puppet theater to sort of tell their, their story because if you are a... Um, a, uh, a protester or you're going against the, the government, you can get arrested, but the government cannot arrest a puppet. So the puppet became a very important um, person or character in telling the story of actu the actual people. And so these are the types of stories that I share with my students and I want them to uh, design a puppet show for as a project uh, towards the end of the semester. I use it um, during, I use it very selectively when I introduce a new topic. So for example, the story of the monkey and the sound of its heart, uh, I use that story and I'll, I'll briefly tell you the story and then we'll get into some Q and A, but it's a story about a monkey who walks around the jungle with his head down and all of the other animals see this monkey. And, they, and the lion comes up to monkey and says, monkey, I see you're always sad. What's going on? I know you like to play music. Uh, do you want some music? And the monkey said, no, no one likes to listen to my, my music. And the lion went and got monkey a set of drums. And monkey was happy. And he started playing the drums. And everyone in the jungle started to dance and they enjoyed the sound of the drums. Uh, but of course, night came and it became very overbearing and Monkey did not want to put down the drums and everyone in the jungle be became upset and they went to Lion for help because Lion is the king of the jungle. And Lion went to Monkey and, mon and told him, uh, stop playing the drums after 10 p.m. And Monkey ignored Lion. And uh, this continued for several days and eventually Lion went and bit off the monkey's pause, right? And the eagle, God in the heaven sent eagle down to try to deal with this, this contention, what's going on here. And eagle came down and saw lion bit off the monkey's paws and took the paws up to heaven, thinking that, okay, fine, this will end the commotion. And it didn't. Eagle on its way up to heaven heard the sound still with the drums. And when Eagle came back down, he saw Monkey playing the drums with his tail. And Eagle said, Monkey, we need you to stop. And he bit off Monkey's tail and took Monkey's tail up to heaven. On the way up to heaven, he heard the sound of the drums playing again. And he came back down and saw Monkey playing the 
the drums with his feet. <laughs> and he bit off the feet up to heaven. On its way up, he heard Monkey's drums again and played the drums. Uh, he came back down and saw Monkey playing the drums with its head. Bit off Monkey's head. And he said, oh, that's it. There are no more parts to play. And on its way up, he still heard the sound. And when he came back, he saw Monkey laying on its back and Monkey was playing the drums with the sound of his heart. So as the heart was beating, the drums was, uh, it was hitting the drums. And this brought tears to the eagle's eye and said, we can't kill Monkey. We gotta um, let, let, let Monkey play the sound of its heart. And so today, if you go into the jungle and you listen very carefully, you'll listen, you'll hear the sound of Monkey's heart beating, but you have to listen carefully and it's very rhythmic. Now that's a story that can be heard in various civilizations, various cultures. And the art of telling the tale is one in which it sends a lesson to the society. It's really told in such a way that people learn and it, they internalize this. Okay. Um, and uh, I use that type of story to introduce them to the cardiovascular system and the history of understanding the cardiovascular system from the tail up to modern day science. So there is my spiel and I am open to any Q and A's uh, and discussion that you all may have. So thank you everyone to our, our panelists on our round table. We're going to launch straight into the Q and A.